So certainly everybody coming along. And there's Angelo. Good to see you. Hello, Shirley. All right, Rob, whenever you want to kick us off, I think we're we're ready for you. Terrific. Well, thank you all for joining us for this evening's legal briefs. Um, uh, the alumni office of the law school has been putting these together for the last few years. We started during COVID. It turned out to be a great way to um, be able to get together, but also to focus on faculty and some of the research the faculty were doing, which was great. And this time, um, Wendy thought it would be a wonderful thing to hear from the dean as we get ready for the upcoming academic year and uh, just get a sense of, um, you know, how things are, are shaping up at the law school. So I am going to introduce um, Richard Bierschbach, our Dean, and, w and John W. Reed, Professor of Law. Um, Rick is now in his seventh year at Wayne Law. Actually, this month marks his seventh year, so I'm no longer going to talk about his history at Cardozo and uh, where he went to law school because he's, he's beyond all of that. We now care about what he's done for us. Um, but as you all probably remember, um, Rick arrived in 2017, and you know his goal was to improve the overall student experience, and um, in doing that, to improve the national reputation of the law school. Um, at that time, Wayne Law was uh, number 100. We're now 56. Um, the uh, employment numbers our 2022 class, which is the last that we have reporting because the ABA, we provide numbers um, 10 months out. And um, for those who have JD required or JD preferred jobs, 91.1% of our students received uh, jobs, full-time jobs. And our bar passage is going up um, last year uh, at this time, um, the July exam, we were 84%. Um, this year's exam just recently took, took place. So knock on wood there. Um, but uh, we also know that um, with any thriving organization, uh, you've always got to be innovative and stay on top of things. And so Rick also very early on recognized that uh, some, some things um, could be done at Wayne Law um, to be able to use the resources that we had and to make sure that it provided us additional revenue. So he created a Master's of Law. Originally, it was in uh, human resources. Um, that was for human resources professionals um, to get some additional help in learning how to work with lawyers and others. And that has grown. This year, we're putting on... Um, the uh, healthcare compliance area. And I see David Rogers and David's um, always one of our healthcare professors. And I assume David's going to be probably involved in some of those classes. I don't know, but uh, uh, we've also had launched a BA in law and um, that will start this fall. Um, we've actually had the minor, minor in law uh, through the undergraduate school for several years and that's been a huge success. So, um, you know, we're one of the few uh, schools to have a BA in law. So also on top of Rick's job as Dean, if it's not already full enough, he continues to be a leading scholar uh, in criminal law and procedure. So among Rick's other uh, honors, he is going to be listed in the August 14th edition of Cranes uh, in their uh, 
um, notable leaders in higher ed. So um, much deserved um, notoriety there that uh, uh, doesn't even um, hit the, uh, scrape the top of all the things that Rick has done for Wayne Law and the successes we've had, but I'll turn it over now to Rick. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, I'm a little embarrassed by the introduction, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, and thanks everybody for being here. It's August in Michigan. The weather's been pretty good. So um, when Wendy gave me this slot, I was like, the August slot? No, I'm kidding, Wendy. Um, uh, um, it's, 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 great to, it's great to be here. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm really interested in answering people's questions, but um, I do, I will spend maybe just 10 minutes it, um, talking about some things um, coming down the pipe for the academic year, since that was, the, was and is the topic of this, of this talk. Um, and maybe I'll just start out with where the law school is. I think Rob gave you a pretty good overview of that already. Um, you know, we're, we're in a strong place. Um, our rankings higher than it's ever been. Not that that is necessarily the appropriate measure of strength. I actually don't think it is, but it's, it's a good thing um, nonetheless. Uh, we're about to bring in a fantastic 1L class. I don't know exactly um, what it will look like, but I can tell you um, if things hold, our median LSAT score will go up yet another point and our median GPA will go up uh, maybe another three one hundredths. So that'll put us at a, a 162 and a 3.83 for our medians. Um, you know, so half the class is above that, half the class is, is below. Um, um, more interesting and maybe more important, um, well, the national application pool has been relatively flat and the pool in the Great Lakes has been up maybe three or 4%. We're up about 20% in applications this year. So that's a, that's a huge deal. Um, we can't really figure out why, honestly. Um, it, it's such an enormous jump. Um, we, we have a couple of working theories. Um, one is we made a big leap in the rankings last year. Well, not last year, two years ago, when this when this application cycle started. So we came into this application cycle ranked in the 50s for the first time ever. Um, and that probably drove a lot of applications to us that we might not otherwise have seen. And the second um, theory is we've been um, doing a lot more digital marketing. And maybe it's a combination of those two things. Um, uh, and um, But over overall, it's just that the schools strong you know, and Rob mentioned our employment numbers and in, in, uh, in, um, you know they're in the, they're in the 90s um, uh, again uh, this year, which is great. Um, our master's program is growing, our master's for non-lawyers. Um, Rob mentioned uh, the, op the initial concentration was human resources and we've added health law. Uh, this year we're hoping to add um, risk management and compliance, and also to have a general MSL. So somebody can come in and kind of mix and match, take, take the core classes and then just get a, a general master's for non-lawyers. Um, again, maybe more um, significant or just as significant. Uh, our enrollment has gone up steadily there. Uh, last year was in the low 50s. This year, it's going to be almost 75. Um, so that's that's been great for us. And that's been bringing, bringing revenue to the school. Um, our minor in law, which Rob mentioned, has uh, over 400 students in it at this point, which is really um, a lot, a lot more than we expected. They're not all taking classes at the same time. That's the number of declared minors, right? They're undergrads. Some of them aren't taking the classes, but they are going to do the minor. Our BA in law, which is launching in the fall, um, and we just announced it maybe a month ago, already has 37 students in it. Um, so that's kind of neat. 18 of those students are new to the university. Um, we don't know if they're new to the university because of our BA in law, uh, because of our BA in law, or if they're just new because they were coming to the university and they were thought the BA in law would be cool. Um, but but that's good. Um, and for having just you know announced it at the end of a recruiting cycle, that's um, we're, we're very optimistic about that. Um, we have several new faculty joining us in the fall. Um, 
three new assistant professors of teaching, which are um, faculty members who are uh, full-time and are going to be really focused on the teaching, more on the teaching side of things and a little bit less on research. Um, and they're going to be great. They're going to be in our master's program, our JV program, uh, and our undergrad program also. Um, we have a new um, tenure track faculty member uh, joining us uh, whose area is property and human rights. Um, and uh, we're really excited about him. He was a uh, visiting professor at Villanova. And then this year, we are, I, I don't think we're gonna fill all these spots, but we are doing a, a large amount of faculty hiring. Um, so um, we are looking to hire maybe six faculty this year, um, which is a lot for a school our size, um, all on the tenure track. Um, one of the things that's going to be challenging for us is the, <coughs> excuse me, the market for hiring um, tenure track faculty has really changed. It used to be a, it used to be a buyer's market, um, and it's not anymore. The number of applicants has gone way down, and so uh, that's that's compl that's complicated. The competition is really more fierce than ever. So. Um, if you know people who are thinking they might want to be a law professor, now is a very good time <laughs> to go to try to become a law professor because uh, people are getting interest and in offers um, who, who um, might not have seen the level of interest and in offers they would have seen five and six years ago. Um, so that's all coming down the pipe. Um, you know, there's things happening at the university too that are going to affect us, I think, I think um, in a positive way. Um, uh, we've got a new president, Kimberly Espy, just started today, was her first day as our new president. Um, she is already um, up to her eyeballs in dealing with things uh, and has been since the moment um, it was decided that she'd be the new president. Um, so, you know, she's got a, a tough act to follow. President Wilson was great um, and uh, he left things um, in a position for her to pick them up and try to make the place even better. And that's what she's gonna do. And I think there's a lot of, um, she's gonna be focused a lot on external relations, focused a lot on donors, focused on the med school um, and, um, and things like that. Uh, the university's enrollment is looking better than it has in a while. We don't have final figures yet, but the university has had budget cuts for uh, almost every year that I've been here. And in the year it didn't have budget cuts, it, it should have had budget cuts, but it didn't have them just to give people a break, but it, that actually created a structural deficit. Um, uh, it's looking like that might not happen next year. Again, don't know for sure, but we know that undergraduate enrollment's up 15% um, so far. Students haven't come back. Maybe, maybe they won't all show up. Maybe it'll land at 8%. Maybe it'll land at 15%. Who, who knows? Um, if it does land at 15%, that's gonna be a big deal for the university. Um, and that's with master's enrollment still being down. And if we can turn master's enrollment around and, and master's enrollment is turning, it's turning more slowly, but it is turning. Programs like ours, there's a new program in the engineering school um, that's bringing in a lot of students, then the university will be in better financial shape. Um, we won't know that for a while, um, but, uh, but we're hopeful. Uh, so that's going to be great. Uh, so that's that's going to be a big part of this academic year, just sort of you know getting our hands around that, and and um, and then the new president is going to have priorities. Right? If we do, if we are in better financial shape, she's going to probably use that um, to further her priorities. And you know, we want the law school to be in in that mix as it has been in the past, and I have every reason to continue to be. Um, the university is looking to the law school as a leader um, among its academic units, and that's a good that's a good place to be. Um, other big changes for this academic year, some of them have already happened, but um, the, the dust hasn't settled around them. One is the change to how US News ranks law schools. Um, that has been, that's really been the, a, a monumental change. It's sort of hard to overstate how big those changes in the rankings methodology were. You know, um, for a long time, US News never changed its methodology. And then I think a couple things happened. Um, there's a, maybe a more uh, a more positive take and a more cynical take. Um, 
maybe the more positive take is, you know, as they started to get feedback, they uh, and started to think about what would best serve consumers. They started to tweak it a little bit. Um, maybe the more cynical take is as schools started to understand it better and game it better, they started to sort of tweak it, to, you know, make it harder for schools to understand it and game it. Um, but either way, I think there was some combination of those two things going on. Um, this year, uh, go, going into th this past ranking, there, there had been a couple of years of criticism really building of US news and, um, and they made massive changes. And the gist of the changes um, were to shift a lot of the rankings weight from inputs to outputs, um, which had been a trend that had been happening anyway, um, but, but what they did is um, they, they reduced the weight on metrics like your, your median LSAT score and your median J GPA for your incoming 1Ls. They reduced that by about half. So it used to be almost 20%. In the most recent um, ranking before this new one, it was almost 20% and, and now it's about 10. It was really, I think it was about 19 before and now it's about nine, but they cut it in, in half. Um, they, and then they, uh, got rid of, they, they cut down on some other things, like there's a peer assessment score that is just um, determined by a survey that goes out to uh, the dean and the assistant dean and the chair of the appointments committee and the most recently tenured faculty member at every law school. They fill out this, you know, one to five, they sort of rank schools on what they think their reputation is. And that was 25% of the school's ranking. So you guys can just cut that in half, it's 12 and a half percent. Um, and they made some other changes too, but what they did is they shifted most of the weight to things like job placement in bar passage. And so bar, um, or I'm sorry, um, job placement used to be 18%, 14% measured at 10 months after graduation, 4% measured at graduation. Now it's 33%, all measured 10 months after graduation. So it's one third of a school's ranking. That is a enormous deal, right? Um, bar used to count for two or 3%. Um, now bar passage counts for 25%. 18% um, of that is what we call ultimate bar pass rate. So that's within two years of, of graduating, how, how many of your students pass the bar. 7% um, of it is first time bar passage, um, but it adds up to 25%. So, you know, right there, you're 58% of the ranking is made up of these two things that before totaled 21%. I mean, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a huge change. And so this year in the rankings, um, a bunch of schools got scrambled all around. Um, uh, not at the top, but sort of in, in the bands where we are, there were a lot, there was some big movement, and especially in the bands below us in the, in the schools ranked, you know, 100, 110, 90, you saw schools moving 30 spots in, in one direction. Um, we uh, went up two spots from the year before. So we, the, the methodology change didn't affect us all that much, um, although it will going forward. Um, and I think the primary effect it's going to have on us uh, and on many other schools and especially schools in our sort of area of the rankings is there's just gonna be a lot more volatility um, because what's gonna happen is if you have a year in which four of your students who normally would get jobs don't. For a school our size, that's a three percentage point change in our employment figure. And if you look at sort of the, the, the ranking just based on employment, a three percentage point change can move you from, just now I'm just ranking employment placement, you know, um, 25 to 57. It's, it can move you a lot um, because the, these things are pretty thinly sliced. And so you plug that into the US News formula and that year you could drop 10 or 15 spots, even though it's just a, a blip, right? You can have a year when four students don't get jobs because, you know, two of them had a medical issue. One of them had a family tragedy. Um, one decided they didn't want to because, you know, they're having a child and, you know, he wants to stay home with the child while his wife will, whatever the thing is, right? You can have, just for idiosyncratic reasons that have nothing to do with your, your strength as a law school, years in which those numbers, you know, vary. Um, and, and just a little bit of variation is going to result in pretty big movements in the rankings. So I think that's, that's going to just going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. And it's also going to be interesting to see um, 
what schools do in response because they will start you know trying to gain this new ranking as well um uh, especially around employment um so that's a big change coming down the pipe um and we'll see sort of um what happens there you know will schools take a bunch of money from scholarships and shift it toward um funding positions for their graduates right um that can that can happen and that can be good we you know we we actually brought some fellows on this past year and it was great they we needed them and they helped us a lot um they also helped our jobs right um but you know um but we didn't we didn't do it to the extent like a really wealthy school could just almost achieve full employment by doing that um uh another um another big change is just the and this will affect other schools more than us but they're you know the result of the decision the supreme court's decision in the harvard um, in unc cases um which is really going to upend for schools um, that have not been subject to these kind of restrictions before really going to upend their admissions practices in a, in a major way. And I'm not sure what the fallout is, is going to be. Um, we, um, you know, for better or worse in Michigan, have operated under uh, proposition, proposal two, um, which is prohibited the consideration of race and other factors in admissions or hiring or things like that in educational institutions and in public employment. Um, and so we, you know, haven't done a lot of the things that other schools have done, like have scholarships that are aimed directly for and restricted to people from certain backgrounds, things like that. Um, uh, so schools that were doing things like that are going to have to stop doing it. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, it could affect faculty hiring as well um, and other things. Um, it still could affect us because I do think that there is more, probably going to be more of um, just more general attention paid and, and, and much more concern about um, making sure that you're absolutely doing everything to comply. And that's not to suggest that we have not been doing everything to comply, but it's just a different environment now. And, you know, there's litigation groups sending letters to all the law school dean saying get ready to get sued right um and that just wasn't happening before the harvard and unc cases um so general counsels are getting involved and things like that um so that's that's going to be interesting for for this year um and then things going on at the law school that are that are fun i'll just mention a few and then i just i want to take questions um one is um uh a lot of a lot of great programs that we've had um, that are growing that you know don't fit the mold of kind of these new degree programs, but I'll just I'll just give a shout out to one or two. And I see um, Professor Robichaud is is on here, and she's involved in one of these, um, which is our our Warrior Housing Corps, um, where our law students have been going into um, 36 District Court in Detroit and help, you know, helping with, with eviction um, uh, proceedings and helping Detroiters facing eviction. And we're going to try to expand that and, and intersect it with this undergraduate program so that we have undergrads who work as legal navigators because the unmet need is just enormous. Undergrads working as legal, legal navigators, maybe working with their JD students to try to help um, people navigate through this system. And help the lawyers. You know, there are some some things lawyers don't necessarily need to be involved in that the undergrads could help with. So I think that it could be a um, a really really cool program. Um, uh, we're doing some interesting things uh, with um, high schoolers, even middle schoolers. But you know, we just did a camp, um, uh, a pipeline camp um, for high school students where they um, learned about careers in law and they got to do kind of hands on things um, where that incorporated legal problems. So, you know, they talked about expectations of privacy in the Fourth Amendment, and then they did sort of an escape room exercise. I mean, they, you know, um, and, 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 and tried to kind of, you know, solve legal problems while doing kind of fun things like that. And it was a huge hit. Um, so we're trying to expand those. We've got a, a, a great um, free law summer institute for native Detroiters to help people um, who are interested in going to law school, prepare, and that's been um, popular and we wanna grow that. Um, and then we're taking a look at some of the things, um, You know, I, I looked at some of the questions people have submitted ahead of time, some of the things that are really gonna affect the profession, like um, 
AI, you know, we don't we don't have any answers on that yet, but we'll be forming a task force at the law school this year to figure out um, how should we be thinking about, you know, generative AI and um, and, and and not not just or even um, mainly with respect to students' work product or anything like that. Although there are going to be you know um, those kinds of things to grapple with, but how how do we train lawyers in a world where this is going to be a, a thing that everybody has and does and uses, right? Um, um, and what's it going to require to be a, a lawyer in in a world where um, you know everybody has generative AI at their fingertips? Um, because you're going to have to have skills that um, don't necessarily come, <laughs> you know, they're they're not intuitive to me. Like effective prompt writing for for um, sophisticated AI um, uh, machines um, is a skill that will be really valuable. And you got to know how to do it. You got to be trained on it. Um, and then being able to engage in the kind of iterative process um, with those with those engines. So that you know those kinds of things are going to be coming down the pipe. Um, the last thing I'll mention um, is a big one. Um, and there has not been a public announcement on this, but you can consider yourselves in on the ground floor, um, maybe even also literally is um, we are working on a new facility uh, for the law school. Um, and so that's that's going to be a really big deal. Um, the law school needs a new facility at this point. Um, it's not 100% clear yet whether by new facility, I mean a major, major, major renovation of the existing plant um, because, you know, there are parts of the existing plant, um, the, the quote unquote new building, right, which is sort of the building that fronts um, um, Palmer and, and, the, and the auditorium and the key center that are in pretty good condition, um, or whether we're talking about a brand new building from the ground up um, somewhere else. But, there, um, but the university is at the point where given the success of the law school in the last six years, and the growth of the law school um, and the problems we're having with the, the old building and the trajectory of things um, that they've committed that this is something they, um, they want to do. And we're talking about um, not only about funding, but about locations. Um, we've talked to the state about funding and we've gotten um, optimistic responses from the state. Um, uh, the state won't fully fund it, but hopefully they'll, they'll give a, a significant chunk of what it would cost. The university would put up some and the rest would have to be raised philanthropically. And, and that, that will be a major amount of money that we need to raise. I mean, a, a very significant amount, but um, uh, it'll position the law school for the next century. You know, we're coming up on the centennial of the law school. It's in 2027. And I think it would be great to have a new facility um, at the time of the centennial to sort of to position the law school for the next uh, 100 years. So that's that's the goal. So um, a lot happening. <laughs> I'll stop, and um, I would love to hear what's on people's minds. Whether if my anything I said triggered questions, or you have any other questions. Folks are welcome to unmute themselves or use the raise your hand function. If you're not in the talking mood, you're welcome to drop something into the chat as well. Um, I will unpin you, uh, Dean Bischoff, just so everyone kind of see everybody. So Rick, I have so many questions because you had so much amazing information that you shared. <laughs> so let's see how this conversation goes. But a couple of things I was taking notes and they kind of jumped off at me. I was curious about the, um, the, the, the BA in law. And um, I, I was reading the article in, uh, in the Wayne Lawyer uh, that I just received. And it mentioned that uh, we're uh, one of the latest institutions to develop a program, uh, University of Arizona, University at uh, Buffalo, and uh, USC. And I'm curious, um, because in the article they talk about uh, that similarly, the BA in law will help many students go into business, and some of them will apply to law school. Are we kind of looking at this or positioning it as a a uh, conduit uh, uh, to law school admissions? And do we have any data from those three schools that uh, are already uh, uh, sort of uh, utilizing the program? That's a great question. Um, it's a great question. Um, I, I, could, I could spend the, the next 30 minutes answering that question because it actually gets into a lot of things we talked about um, as, we, as we were working on this program. So the short answer is, um, 
Well, there's not really a short answer, but I'll try to give you one. The short answer is we at the law school are not looking to this to feed our law school. That, that, that is not the intent of the program. Um, although we expect that you know, some people who do it um, might apply to win law. Um, the longer version of the, uh, of the, the longer answer is um, we do think that the program will have some important pipeline enhancing effects because one of the great virtues of the program is you get undergrads who can be exposed to this way of thinking, this approach to the, the world, this career path that they might not know anything about. And that um, the costs of exploring, if they didn't um, encounter this until after they graduated would just be too high, right? It's sort of hard to kind of take a chance on law school. You gotta be pretty committed, but um, you might wanna major in it or double major in it. Right. And so and, and that has been an important um, the, the, the thing, the data, the best data we have is really from the University of Arizona, because that's been a, around the longest that program. And the um, the number of students from underrepresented backgrounds um, in their BA program is much larger than the number of underrepresented students in their in their law program. Um, and, and then those students form connections and they sit next to somebody who's always wanted to go to law school. They learn about, hey, you really got to prepare for the LSAT way ahead of time. It's stuff that they otherwise wouldn't have known, right? And, and they wind up going to law school. Now, they might not come to our law school, right? Um, and, and another interesting bit of data that University of Arizona um, had is when those students do go to law school, and what they found is, is um, under 50% under apply to law school, under 50%. Um, it's, I think it was maybe like 40%, under 50% apply to law school. But when they do, it's often they, they don't go to university or, you know, they go to wherever, they go to Harvard or Yale or where they go off to some, uh, you know, law school, they, they're having a hard time keeping them. Some of them go to University of Arizona, but it's not really designed as a, as a feeder program. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I mean, I think that's what, that's, that's the main thing I would say on that side of it. Um, the interesting philosophical thing that I could talk for 30 minutes on is, um, would you want students coming to law school who already studied law as an undergrad or not? And there was a debate that raged among our faculty on this. You know, there was one camp that said, um, it's really important that people have sort of as broad exposure to liberal arts thinking as possible. And we don't really want to encourage people to look at law before they go to law school. And there was another group that said, I disagree. It's, it's it's you know these are undergrad classes. They're not they're not you know one L classes. They're taught in a different way, at a different pace. Um, it's going to be important for some people to 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 um, have this exposure, to feel comfortable, to get prepared. So I'm not sure what the right or there was probably not a right answer. There's probably value in both of those perspectives um, is on that. But that is you know that's something to think about when it comes to that question. I have a whole lot more, so if no one else I see wants a question, to jump in. Um, uh, that is, is about um, if there is a new law school building, um, uh, might it be located closer to downtown? And the answer is it, it might. We don't know. Um, all, all, all that stuff is all that stuff is on is on the table right now. Um, you know, it, it, on the one hand, we love being the the entrance to campus where we are, and a lot of people love that location. And it's nice to be on campus, especially if we have a thriving undergraduate program. On the other hand, it'd be really nice to be right down by, you know, where a lot of the firms are, right, right down by the courts, um, maybe right down close to the business school. A lot of the a lot of the undergrads um, who are in our program, especially the minor in law, are in the are in the business school. They're getting a, a bachelor's in business. Um, so there's sort of pros and cons, and I think uh, the, the answer to that is going to just turn on feasibility, um, and feasibility is going to turn largely on um, financing and, and funding and, and, and that sort of thing. I saw a couple other questions up, uh, um, that people had sent in. I don't know the answers to 
all of them. One of them though was whether the pinball machine was still in the basement. And I don't think it is. I think it's been replaced by a foosball machine. So I thought it was important to answer that. Um, there's another question um, about um, whether uh, there's kind of, there's pre-law pipeline programs um, to, to, and this intersects a little bit in some ways with your question, Angelo, to help students. And I mentioned a couple of them. Um, um, our DJK Pre-Law Institute has been really successful. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the pipeline program that has replaced kind of, I think the, the, the older one, which was um, aimed, you know, I think more directly, I think I had half of the students were quote unquote minority and the other half were quote unquote non-minority, the one that was, you know, before my time. But this is, this one's um, for, for native New Yorkers. Um, but we are exploring more things that, um, more possibilities for, um, for both assisting people who want to go to law school and also even evaluating applications in different ways. We haven't reached any conclusions on these things, but there are, um, the University of Arizona, again, they've been pretty innovative in this space. They pioneered a thing called JD Next, which is an online program, but it's, a, but it's, um, it, it's um, uh, got, you know, live teachers for some of it, and it's got a mentoring for some of it, um, where it takes students through, I think, the, the, the basics of legal reasoning and, um, uh, I think it uses contracts as the vehicle for that um, and helps them uh, with the skills you would need to be an effective 1L student. And they've actually used it to measure, um, to try to measure, um, you know, or predict success in law school um, as an alternative to the LSAT and have found that it's a pretty um, statistically um, uh, uh, reliable uh, um, instrument and it passed pass a lot of the or all of the, the requirements for being a, a valid um, uh, predictive test. And so they're starting to try to use that in their admissions process. Um, and you don't have to use an admissions process. You could also just use it as an effective pipeline thing. We're, so we're starting to look at uh, things like that as well. Um, you know, there's some discussion, as I think you all know, of the ABA maybe doing away with the LSAT uh, or, the, or the testing requirement. Um, and, or if they don't do away with it, maybe saying, you know, 25% of your class doesn't have to take a test. So we're trying to kind of stay out and ahead of a, a lot of those things. Um, uh, so a lot of changes, you know, between that U.S. News and, and the, and the post-Harvard UNC landscape. Admissions is going to look pretty different in the next few years um, than it did two or three years ago. Ed, you've got your hand up. I know, and usually... I just butt in, Dean. One <laughs> yeah. of the recommendations that I would make, being one that's in probably, and it's not bragging, just my business, four courtrooms a day, running into scattered Wayne alum, just all over Wayne County, and sometimes Monroe County, working in prosecutor's offices, working in defense firms, working in the courts, running into judges, and having served in the past on both the Board of Visitors and the Alumni Association, I think there should be a concerted effort towards reaching that group that felt like many did from my class. And my class was decades ago, that they were somehow insular from the real action of the law school because they didn't drift to big firms, gravitate to great success, very seldomly profiled or anything because they just went right out of private practice and doing what they want to do, which is practice law every day. My recommendation is if you're going for a new construction project, having worked with the one in 2000, that you attempt to develop an outreach to those lawyers who maybe either feel distance or just staff with, with where things have gone, just because they don't feel a connection to come back. I mean, they all go downtown every day. They go to Frank Murphy every day. They go to the uh, Coleman Young Hall of Justice there. They're always in court. They're at the 36th District Court and they're all over and they're Wayne alums. And I always made it a premise with the prosecutors who worked for me, with the city attorneys, that if they're a Wayne alum, they get an extra pass. And that type of camaraderie could be reflected also in their return. And that might be something to look forward to. I don't, it's too much to put on your plate now to ask what the efforts are. It's not a matter of giving because they fear they're going to be asked for a buck, but they need to be touched first to come down to see the school, to yeah. see where they were and where it is today, because it's truly impressive. Thanks, Ed. It's a great point. 
And I don't know that that's not really a question. That was kind of like a speech. no, but it's a good point. And in in um and I know Rob has been um Rob and, and his team have been working on on those kinds of things. Um, but it's it's important. I mean, I think there are we got twelve thousand alumni, and they don't all feel connected, to say the least, right? And so that's uh, and it's you know we want them every last one of them to feel connected. I mean, Dean, there are in other fields. We have I run into physicians, school superintendents, professors at other universities, community yeah. colleges, high school teachers who are all Wayne alums. And somehow, if we could bring them back into that great tent before you break ground on the new facility. Yep, yeah, agreed. All right, and that's my comment for the day. And <laughs> sorry about the pinball machine. That's really hard to break. <laughs> hey, Hi there, it's uh, not so much a question that I have, but I think it's hard to sit in a room and, and the door is open for you to say what's on your mind and you don't articulate that. So I'm not uh, framing my two thoughts on a need to answer or to have further discussion, but um, uh, I am very, uh, very uh, troubled by the recent uh, affirmative action decision um, I, in 1972, went to Michigan Law School along with probably 38 African Americans who were in my class, uh, the first year class at that time. All of us graduated and all of us, and I, if I start naming names, you'd recognize most of them who have made a difference in, uh, in our state, in the country, in fact, um, upon graduation. And we wrote an amicus, part of the amicus brief for the Bruder decision and Michigan's uh, uh, procedure in admissions, uh, I, I think in, in some small part uh, uh, relied on the, the uh, surveys taken by my class and those who were in the schools with me and what our success and com commitment to the community was. So I, I am very, very troubled by what's going on now and know that it will have a chilling effect whether or not Michigan has not, uh, has quote, been in compliance over these years, it's going to have effect on the educational system hiring. And it's already, unless firms are taking an affirmative uh, approach, taking the initiative that, that just being passive, it's going to weigh uh, the opportunities down. So that's troubling. It's not a discussion we could have today, but it's uh, very important that the law school uh, uh, be viewed in this community as one that's going to support um, uh, diversity at the university at, at every level. So that's something that if there is a task force or just a conversation about, I'd uh, love to take part in that and have a number of uh, colleagues who would be very helpful in moving those discussions uh, through. My other concern is with uh, uh, ethics uh, in the law. Uh, I had a very different view of what lawyers were, what judges did, and how, and just the culture of law, I'm very, very disappointed uh, with reading about all the challenges that we have in um, our profession and how we present to the community, to young people uh, in the behavior of lawyers in the court system, uh, politically, you name it. And I, I don't want this to be a forum on politics, but uh, there needs to be more conversation in the law schools that don't get caught up in the politics of the day that deal with the code of professional ethics. You know, we just have strayed away from that so much that it's embarrassing to even hear what attorneys are saying, what judges are doing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we really do need to reevaluate how we are as lawyers, uh, our culture. Uh, and again, a lot of the things that are happening now, I just could never have imagined, and I'm sure you're in the same boat where you just could not even think of a lawyer doing or saying or representing or a judge behaving in a certain way. And I, again, am not talking about the political side of it, but behaviors are just uh, totally unacceptable. So that worries me about the future of the law and what young people must think observing us uh, as a body. And I want to add one more thing 
uh, in that conversation. And Ed, I agree that we have not done a good job uh, maintaining uh, our alumni uh, connection relationship with uh, the, the law school, with the university. And if uh, and I know, uh, Rob, you you really reach out, you touch everybody, you don't let anyone get away from you and your efforts to promote uh, the university. But I really, really think more time and money needs to be spent in development uh, to reconnect uh, so many of us who um, love Wayne State uh, for the education and, and uh, opportunities it's provided us but just never felt that we were part of that. And so once we left, we took our degrees and, and we've just not turned back. So if there are ways that we can get involved uh, more and support the university, again, that's an area I'd like to be involved in as well. Shirley, I know you, you didn't call for this discussion, but I won't, I, I won't give any discussion, but I think those are three really good points. Um, you know, and they're, I don't know if the last one's connected, but I think the first two are kind of connected. I just think we're living in this time, you know, where um, we don't, people just don't, don't even, not only do they, do they not know, they don't, they often don't try to relate to each other in a in sort of a civil way across boundaries anymore. And it seeps into everything, and um, and I think it colors how we think of things, and even uh, you know colors how we think of things like diversity and affirmative action, but also colors kind of the tenor of conversations that, even if they're not political, you know, they're conversations where people are sort of speaking to each other across, trying to speak across difference, and they just they go off the rails now because nobody knows how to do that anymore. Um, and it's it's something we we need to. Um, I think we've had, we've had, I'm going to knock on, I have a wooden desk. You know, we haven't had the situations at our law school that, um, that some other law schools have had, but it doesn't, um, but I think we need to do um, a, a lot more to try to inculcate the kind of values and do our part to try to think, bring things back to where they, um, you know, where they need to be for your comments, surely. Um, I just received another question, which um, uh, I don't know the technical answer to, but I, I can give you a general answer. Um, and the question was um, a while back um, in the in the seventies, um, Michigan had a higher curve than Wayne Law did. So Michigan Law School had like a B curve, and Wayne Law had a C curve, which um, put our students at a disadvantage. And the question was, is that still the case? Um, and uh, I don't know if the two curves are exactly the same, but uh, we don't have a C curve anymore. Our curve is our curve is um, more generous than that, but maybe not as generous as Michigan's. That's the part I don't know the answer to, um, um, because it's a it, it it you know it is an interesting point. We don't want our students to to look bad um, in the market. We also want our students to, who um, perform well on their transcript to perform well um, with their employers. Um, we want our, all of our students to do that, but we don't want somebody to look and say, oh, you know, gosh, we, we expected more given the, the GPA or whatever the case or um, whatever the case is. Just chomping at the bed. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, from it, well. I heard. I heard. I, if I heard you, if I heard you correctly, Rick, in your sort of opening remarks, you said that the applications to uh, Wayne Law up twenty percent from last year. From last year, and the the next thing you said, and I don't know if you were if you were just uh, uh, having fun, but you said we don't really know why. We really, really need to know why. I know. What, I what, know. How might we go about really picking that apart? Because I'm curious, and again, these things may not correlate, but I'm curious again about the rankings that we continue to get about the best value law schools, right? I mean, and in your in your letter again, uh, uh, in, in, in Wayne Lawyer, you mentioned that, and I'm 
I, I still feel that that is a very big differentiator for Wayne State Law School. It is an attraction for people who say it's not going to put me so deeply in debt. And then I'm hoping that I can get a job that will over time help me retire that debt. It, it is really something special that I think we have to offer that differentiates us. And I'm wondering if that's part of this driver in a inflationary times. It's yeah, it, again, it's a really good question. I think it is. Um, I think it is. Um, uh, and I, you know, I was kind of having fun, but not really. I mean, we don't really know why we have, like I said, we have some theories, but it's, it's hard to, short of kind of surveying everybody who applied, which we could do and asking them, what, what is it, you know, here, here are 20 things, which rank, you know, the, the top three that made you apply to Wayne Law, um, and seeing what we get. I'm not sure if we can know ex ex exactly, um, but I can tell you what I think we would get. Um, I think we would get, um, ranking. Um, because we know students are really sensitive to 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 um, to ranking, um, and I think Angela, you're exactly right. We would get um, cost. These are the two things that they're most sensitive to, and we've been giving a lot of scholarships. Um, uh, and one thing that we always trumpet in our um, marketing materials is we're number 14 in the country, based on of all law schools, right? Based on um, the ratio of debt to starting salary of our graduate of our graduates number 14 that's strong right and if you look at only public law schools we're number four um so that is a really really good value and i i think that there is a lot to the story that people are more concerned about value than ever and then that and then the other thing that goes into that is we then sort of um you know, drive the whatever the the I don't know what the right metaphor is not the nail in the coffin, right? But you know, the the final blow to sort of to win them over um is is the um is that our employment our employment numbers are very high. So it's like you 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 know you know it's a good price, it's a great ranking, and you're going to get a job. I mean that those three things speak to a lot of students. Um, and you know, six years ago was an okay ranking. Um, the value was still good, but again, value sort of is like, what are you getting for your money? And the ranking wasn't as high, and the jobs were not nearly as strong. Now, when I when I became dean, the first thing I heard from alumni is, "We have got to do better at getting our students jobs," and it was spot on. It was the thing everybody should have been saying to me. They were exactly right to say it, um, and we completely changed our approach to that office and um and you know um we've been doing a lot better and, and i think that matters a lot for these applications and then when you and then when you um then actually get the word out about that because you have a, a, a digital marketing you know um uh strategy which we didn't have before i think that that helps um, you know, the, the resurgence of Detroit could have something to do with it. Um, another thing that could have something to do with it are um, we have a strong reputation for social justice. I will give a shout out again to, um, and it's not just because she's on the call, but to our, our clinics and our externships and things like our holistic defense partnership with our School of Social Work, which no other law school has in the country that we're aware of. There might be one. But you know, to partner with the graduate school of social work to train um, students how to approach criminal justice defense holistically, and to train social work students alongside them and have corresponding field placements, that's really cool. And um, this this generation of students is more um, socially minded than ever. Um, even if they want to go to law firms, they want to come in and they want to get that experience, right? And so and so we hit those points hard, also. And I think those. Those have got to help because those things aren't just cookie cutter things. Those are things that are like that we are doing that other schools aren't doing. Um, so um, that's my theory, but you, you know, gosh, maybe there's a better way to find out. <laughs> David, I think you were trying to ask a question. I did. I had a, uh, excuse me, a comment and a question. Uh, first is my comment. I just want to pick up on what Shirley and what Ed were saying a little bit ago about the importance of alumni feeling connected to the law school. I think at the time when it comes to fundraising, um, 
people who are who feel a connection to the law school before the request for money comes out will make a big difference. Um, they picture students, they have a sense of the school. They there's a connection when you've been out of law school practicing law with a bunch of old codgers for a long time, and then you come back um, and have that connection to the young students. I think that makes a big difference in how people feel about the law school. And I think the result of that could be, uh, you know, a significant difference in fundraising. That's just my comment. Um, secondly, um, you know, they say to a hammer, everything's a nail. I'm a healthcare lawyer. I teach healthcare law at Wayne. And um, I work with healthcare professionals pretty much every day. And I hear over and over again, day after day, year after year, how nobody in the professional healthcare professional schools, nobody learns about the kinds of things that they have problems with later um, in legal issues. Um, you know, I often am talking to them when they've already had problems, whether it's licensing or payer audits or compliance issues, those kinds of things. And I've wondered from time to time, and maybe part of it in my mind now is this effort and having either undergraduate or other graduate schools, like the School of Social Work, that's probably a little more of a connection that is in my mind, but something that would connect at least a little bit the law school to healthcare professional schools, whether it's um, Applebaum or whether it's um, um, this medical school for quite a long time, a long time ago, 15, 20 years ago, I taught that it was just once a, a semester a little seminar on healthcare law issues for internal medicine residents. And they never heard any of this stuff until we talked about it in a, a seminar for two or three hours one afternoon. Uh, and I did that for a few years, but I just, it, it seems like there could be some relationship or some connection, maybe it's not as high a priority as some of these other things we've discussed, but maybe something that would put law school or law training at least for for kind of basic legal issues into the programs for health professionals. I think the health professionals will be better off for it. And it might be an interesting thing for the law school as well. Um, I see we've got some other um, people in the queue, but I just real quickly, David, I think it's a great point. And that's actually one of the things we're gonna try to do with this master's. Um, the master's is an entire degree, but we're gonna try to break off modules of it, either as certificates or even as just standalone things you can take. And I've got a little daughter behind me. Um, um, uh, so that um, uh, people can get that kind of exposure because it's a it's a huge need. Um, and, you know, we're hoping pe people might want the whole degree, but not everybody's going to need the whole degree. So we mm -hmm. can do some of it in, in a modular way as well. Um, give me one second, guys. My sure. wife is in New York. So here I am. Here I am with my kids. Greg, I do see your hand up. So when uh, the dean returns, we'll make sure that uh, back. you you get next. <laughs> Greg, do you want to do you want to ask your question? Oh sure, I, I didn't see that he's back. Um, yeah, hi, Dean. I am uh, a graduate of, of both the engineering and law school from Wayne State. And over over the many years, I guess engineering was 1980 and law was 1992, but I've tried to stay pretty connected with both schools in, in various capacities. And uh, I recently heard, and I think you mentioned that there may be coming a collaboration between the law school and the engineering school. And I'm very excited about that. And I just wasn't sure if we know yet uh, what the nature of that will be or what that will look like, or is that still to be determined? Uh, it's still to be determined, although I can tell you um, an important part of it is we are going to expand the undergraduate um, minor to the engineering school, because there are a lot of undergraduate engineers who want some um, facility in the, um, in the um, fundamentals of law that intersect with their profession. Um, and so that's, that's how we're going to start. And then um, from there, you know, a lot of these master's programs we're doing are, um, are, are designed, as I said, to be, to be modular in some way. Um, 
And, and so this, this MSL, this master in the study of law, it has a core of, um, of survey classes, surveys of the common law, surveys of regulatory law, um, procedure, things like that, that you can sort of wrap a bunch of specialty classes around. And we might start making that available to the engineering school also um, if we can find areas in which, you know, advanced engineers would want to study, um, uh, would want some, some sort of legal framework and legal context for the kinds of things they're, they're doing. Um, and, I, and I'm sure those, are, those areas are there, but that is the part that we haven't developed yet. That's on, that's on the, the, the list of, you know, to be, to be rolled out within a few years. And is, is there an anticipated start date for that, or you say a few years? Is that That's still a, a, that, that pro, honestly probably um, there's not an anticipated start date, but my guess is three years from now. Okay, that's my that's my best guess. The undergrad, the the minor, is probably going to be um, in the fall of a year from now, fall of twenty four. We have come up on an hour, and so I want to be mindful of everybody's time, not just the dean's time. So, um, if there's anything else that's lingering, please there's, speak oh. now. Or, Dean, if you have any like closing comments as well. No, uh, I don't really have any closing comments. There's one little uh, small lingering question that I want to answer because I think oh, it's sure. important, and it was about um, uh, again a, a, a while back. Um, it, it seems that, and this is the first I'd heard of this. Um, that there were a number of weeks after uh, the end of exams and graduation, which meant that a number of our grads had to miss graduation because they had to go and study for the bar. Um, again, that doesn't happen anymore. Graduation is a couple of days after exams end, and, um, and then the bar um, studying starts about a week after that. Um, um, because, you know, what a drag. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that we ever did that, but what a drag to, to like miss your law school graduation because you got to go study for the bar. Um, um, the, no, the only thing I want to say is, um, you know, one, one question that was sent in ahead of time was how can, how can alumni, um, how can alumni help? I'm just looking, looking at this question here. Are there key ways alumni can get involved and support the school. Um, and I would just say things like this and, and, it, you know, um, Come down to the school, say hi. Um, uh, you know, come to a happy hour. Just build um, build the esprit de corps. Um, it's not, you know, as the point was made. It's it's about bringing people into the tent, back into the tent if they were if they were out of it, or um, or you know, celebrating the people who were who, who've been in it the whole time. Um, but I think just celebrate the school and each other is the big thing. Um, and, and get the good word of mouth out about the things going on at the school and you know and the rest will follow right um, and that's um, and that's going to be an important thing to do as we move forward on some of these things that I identified um, including but not only um, a new facility a new facility right a new facility is a big lift um, but I I'm confident we can do it the university is behind us um, and if we do do it it'll be a really big deal for the future of the school so um, you know you'll hear more about that over the coming year I hope Thank you, Rick. I will also just quickly comment that um, on August 15th uh, at 530, we are going to be having a social event for alumni at the Ferndale Project, uh, which is a brewery on Livernois in um, just the edge of Ferndale, the edge of Detroit. So um, hope people can join us for that. And there are always some great opportunities for um, volunteering for moot court judging and that sort of thing. So uh, love to have you back on campus. And I know Greg just recently volunteered here. I can't remember what the event was, but some other some other great things. I know so many of you all do, and that is very important to us. And we greatly appreciate all of your involvement. And that's what makes this place. I mean, several of you um, teaching and other things. So we appreciate all of you. I second that, and I want to thank Wendy for organizing this. Um, Wendy, thank you. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for, again, meeting here um, uh, on this great Tuesday, um, and I hope to see you all soon.
Bye, everyone.